Well, what a special morning for us as we do get to celebrate 25 years to almost to the day. I think it was the second we started uh, since our first service as a church. We met in the Comfort Suites and Highlands Ranch. It, the ceiling was about seven feet tall, and it was quite a service. But for three weeks, the first three sermons is the first one we just looked at the first commandment of God the Father, that we're to have no other gods before him. And as a church, just devoted that God would be the one that we seek over everything else. The second week, we looked in Revelation 2, how not to lose our first love. And no matter what we do, that we, we never lose Jesus as, as that center piece and core to everything. And then we looked at the Holy Spirit as the only one who can apply this and sanctify us and make us holy. And so we, we sought that the one thing I have asked to dwell in the house of the Lord all my days, that we would be a church that communes with God, seeks his face, and knows him through this word. And so we committed together that we would seek him. After 25 years, day in and day out, highs and lows, sense of nearness, sense of dryness, and every high and stormy gale holds within the veil, we, we have sought the face of God together as a body. As I was thinking on this, I have learned that God is faithful. Even when we're faithless, we have learned much about the faithfulness of God over these years. We've journeyed and, and we've learned. And I stand in awe of the one who's truly faithful because of his hessedness, this covenantal faithfulness in this new covenant in Jesus Christ, not because of us. We get no glory. God gets all the glory for what he's done in our midst. When I return from vacation, I want to present, if God should tarry and we're still here, uh, what do we want to do with the next 25 years? So if I'm here and you roll me up in a wheelchair, what do I want to preach on? You know, so what we have learned and how will that affect our reaching forward to what lies ahead is what we will look at this morning. It's quite a tune you got there, brother. Ma made me want to dance. I... I would be remiss um, if I didn't thank you, Southside Bible Church, for your faithfulness over all these years. We got some 25-year long haulers, I hate to use that term now, but just who have been here 25 years, uh, some new for just several months. And you've given yourself to Christ, to the obedience of the faith. 99% of my counseling is how can I live obedient to God? You've been faithful to this body. You've been faithful to give. You've been faithful to serve and pray and mentor and just a consistency to not forsake the assembling together. So I, I rejoice in your faithfulness. I thank my God for you and my every remembrance. My weaknesses and sins and lack of understanding, uh, you've loved, you've confronted You've prayed for, you've covered, you've forgiven. The agape, the agape that I have for all of you is, is great. I want to thank my wife, who of course is serving right now and not in here, but every anniversary I just picture for 20 years, we did this every year, and, and watching her with all these little kids and crawling in crawl spaces to do everything so that we could have a, a meal together. And all that I've watched her sacrifice for 25 years, I just am grateful to God for her and, and for my children who had to sacrifice much of their daddy through the years and just so grateful uh, for them. All right, enough sentimentalism. Um, I, I got to preach a sermon. So if you will come with me, turn to Philippians chapter 3, where we've read out of this morning already. I just was asking God, what should I preach on for such a special day in our history? Uh, I, I can't get over Romans, and some of you are really ministering to me that, that you're, you're just like me. You can't just walk away from Romans and say, what's next? You're like, I'm really struggling without Romans, and so I, I love you. I'm glad that I'm not the only crazy one in this church. I, I love Romans, I love the obedience of the faith for the glory of God, that all things are leading us to believe this gospel and to seek to obey him because we are accepted and love that God would get the glory. So Paul just labored so hard in the book of Romans. And, and I just thought what, what might be cool this morning is if we kind of pulled out of that letter then to Rome 
and said, you know, I, I was thinking, who would be a good one to share their testimony who've been here 25 years? And I thought, Paul's been here 25 years. We've been looking at Romans almost that many years. And so, um, Paul, will you share your testimony with us, Southside Bible Church, this morning? Just as a grandfather, put us on your knee and share what Romans did to you personally. And Paul is going to share his testimony with us this morning, and may it be every testimony in this church in principle, because this is what Romans has been driving to since we started. So let's go to our God and ask him to do that in every heart. Father, we're at the make up your mind time, the what, what do we do with the book of Romans? And so I pray that everyone in this place would have the faith that we're about to look at now. God, that you would make us alive to Christ. Lord, that you would sanctify and bring us sweetly to the promise of glory that you've given in this word, an enduring promise that cannot fade away. God, meet us here this morning in a mighty way, 25 years to celebrate as we stare at the glorious gospel. Meet us, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Philippians chapter 3. What I like about Philippians, Paul's writing it from prison. You would expect him maybe to be a little discouraged. Uh, one of his most joy-filled, rejoicing letters in the canon of Scripture is Philippians. And so we again pray to be men, women, and children like that. By way of uh, introduction, I came across an illustration this week that just stuck with me, uh, and it, it really helped my thinking narrow in on this passage and opened it up for me. So I'm going to borrow it. Um, it's, it's the consideration of light that comes out from a lamp or light that comes out from a laser beam. And I always hate stepping out of my comfort zone, and this is it. Uh, we have so many engineers in this church. Uh, feel free. Some of you probably even work on lasers. So if you need to correct me in the middle of it, I give you permission. Just jump up, help the body, use your gift. So regular light, you just turn on a lamp, and it just goes in every direction at once, and it lights up a room, and a laser is a very focused direction, and there's a, there's a power to it as it comes to a point. And what Paul is going to share in this testimony this morning, Philippians 3.14, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's a beautiful word to press on means to focus, to narrow into one thing. I, I would say to laser focus. It's used in verse 12. Not that I've become perfect or have already become, I press on so that I might lay hold of this. <laughs> it's also used in Philippians 3, 6. I was a persecutor of the church. And what that means is anyone that named the name of Jesus, Paul was so laser focused, he went after you to put you in jail or to death. So he was just so laser focused on protecting the name of God through this false gospel in his mind of Christianity. And so this word needs to be understood. Paul's going to laser and say, one thing I do. The intensity of focus is what the obedience of faith that we learned in Romans is all about. It is a laser on Christ. And so what I like about what Paul is going to share with us is that a spiritual laser beam from heaven hit Paul on the road to Damascus. He's going to kill the Christians and persecute them, and this laser beam comes and hits him. And he, he says, I, got, I, I grasped vehemently because I was grasped by God. I, that, that laser got me. That's the gospel. That's what we're going to look at this morning, is that God lasers you, and you lay hold of Christ with your life. So as we begin, this is what I want for you this morning. I don't want to beat around the bush. I want to be as straight as I know how to. What Romans is to do, if you beheld it by faith, is because uh, some of you sit here without this faith. And this morning, I, I was just praying, driving over, that God would give you that faith. That you, you marked up Romans, but did it mark you? That's what Paul's going to drive to this morning. I am after your eternal good, that you would know this blessing if you never have. Because this is what we're dealing with today in our society and in our churches. Christianity has truly just become something you take up. It's another religion. Uh, I'm going to try it. You add it on to your life. And, and will it help my life be better? 
Some say, I was raised in it. I just can't live without it. I, I need to go to church for my own psyche. It's just a very private thing. We don't talk about it. I'm just a casual Christian. I don't want to be a fanatic after all. And this gospel cannot leave you in that place. It, it, you can't, I call that a little lamp. That's just light going out everywhere. I take in thoughts from the world, from my personal pursuits, my religion, my self-help books, all, all these things. I'm just adding little pieces into my life. And Paul is going to call you this morning for a laser. This is Christianity. This is what we're on this morning. Paul says, my entire life focus and aim and ambition is now a laser focus on Jesus Christ. He'll say, I just do one thing. You ask me about my whole life, I can boil it down. One thing. That's laser. And so this morning, your outline is, I want to look at two truths that Paul shares that will give you this laser focus for Jesus Christ and his gospel. And it's really a simple outline. The first one is, we're taken hold of. And the second point is now we take hold of what has taken hold of us. So we're taken hold of, and now we take hold of that which took hold of us. It's pretty simple. First, in this gospel, we're taken hold of. Look at Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. I take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. The two are joined. They they point to the same thing. They're, They're married. So first, what I want you to see then as we begin, this is Romans. Paul says, not that I have already obtained it or that I have already become perfect. So a believer in Jesus Christ, you are aware or conscious that your condition must be improved. I've had people say, because my condition must be improved, I must not be a Christian. And I want you to throw that out right now. Paul is looking at one of the greatest Christians who's ever lived, saying, I haven't got there yet. I need to grow in my conformity to Jesus Christ. You're not perfect. You have remaining sin, believer in Christ. Not reigning, but remaining. And the good that I want to do, the battle of Romans 7, I don't. And the things that I do, I, do, I don't. So I have way more sin still in my life than I hoped or prayed for when I began this journey. But that is not to conclude that I'm not a Christian, as the devil will, t- will tell you. So I want you to hear these encouraging words. The great apostle is telling you, I am not there. I'm a pilgrim. I am in progress. I have much ground to cover. And sometimes these idealistic standards that are so beautiful make it sound like we're living it. I've always said, I learned this from uh, Pastor MacArthur, I can preach a much better sermon than I can live. Let this comfort your hurting soul this morning or even your discouraged heart. Uh, You have not arrived. And then listen to what Paul says. I'm not there. But you know what? That is not to say this. Oh, good. It's okay that I'm not there. No one is. I I can relax now and just feel better about where I'm at. It just, it it encourages me so much. And Paul's saying, no, that's not it. Take encouragement. You're not strange that that you're, you're not there yet. None of us are. We're far from it. Paul was far from it. Because we're not there, though, Paul says this, you must bear down on your goal and keep pressing. The fact that you're not there doesn't say, oh, let me kick up my feet because we're all not there. Let's fellowship around that we're not there. And Paul's saying, no, you're not there, but I need you to focus on where you want to go. Onward, onward, onward. Picture this. I was just thinking maybe you're a couple in Philippi and the Judaizers come in and they say, hey, you need to add circumcision to Jesus Christ and keep these laws. You need to be perfect. And they try and they can't do it and they're ready to give up. And they go to a meeting and Paul's letter is read. 
It says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And you're like, I, I'm not all the way there. And then they go to verse 12, I'm not yet perfect. Hope springs up again in every believer. And that's what Paul's doing. He's taking on the te teaching of perfectionism. He's shepherding, shepherding us so that we will not be disheartened, but will continue to press forward to what lies ahead. So a really mature man or woman is aware that they're not. I'm not there. I haven't attained this. In humility, I'm aware of what I need to keep pressing on to become. I was thinking of chariots of fire with Eric Little. One man said, if I can't win, I won't run. And one lady said to him, if you don't run, you can't win. Don't miss what Paul says. I press on so that I might lay hold. It's a beautiful word used for a sprinter. And it carries the idea of a, of a runner straining every spiritual muscle in this maybe 100-yard dash. And it's the finish line where you're almost perpendicular to the ground trying to reach forward to go through the ribbon. That's the word that he's choosing here. We're, we're, we're straining every spiritual muscle that we have in this laser focus of running to win the prize. And we run not to become a citizen, but because we are. And so I run, I chase, I pursue with maximum effort using the means of grace that God has given to me. So I'm not already perfect. So I press on. I press on with a laser focus. And what is it that we're after? What do we press on for? Paul says, in order that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. So catch this. Paul is saying, I'm pressing on for the very thing which Christ laid hold of me for. The reason that he redeemed me on the road to Damascus has become the goal of my life. When I was going to persecute the Christians, he laid hold of me, and now I persecute after that for which he laid hold of me on that road. This is the response of free grace, a focus now that free grace came in my life and saved me, and now that is my goal. And what was that? Greg read it this morning in our Sunday school, Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, and whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. So he, he laid hold of you to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, he laid hold of that. That's what I'm after. Why did God save us? To make us like Jesus Christ and put him on display. He was laid hold of to make us like him. That's why we sit here this morning more like him, because he laid hold of us. So the goal of your life is to be made like the Son of God. And the conclusion is we are in a lifelong pursuit of Christ's likeness. That's why he laid hold of you. And in the end, you, you get that. The finish line, you're going to be made like Christ. So you're running after a goal that is certain, and you're going to get there. And you're going to be radiating like Christ. Paul said this to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 14. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The goal of Christ is my goal. It's my life commitment to become like Christ. Is that what you're pressing toward this morning? The point I don't want you to miss is this, of that for which I was laid hold of. I don't want you to run past that because that seems to be missing today in our churches. Paul was going to persecute the Christians. Something laid hold of him on Damascus. He wasn't seeking it. It was seeking him. Paul never struggled with being a seeker. He's going to kill people, right? So something sought him. He wasn't seeking it. Christianity, hear this. It's not something you take up. It takes you up. You can't pull out. It, something is taking you up. I wish I could go through this church right now and everyone share your testimony. And every testimony is Christ took you up. And you can testify it's different in every life. 
but it came and took you up. Something broke into your life, a force, a power, a person took you up. And it looks different in every person, but it must happen to every person. I was taken up by Christ. He laid hold of me wandering from the fold of God. He put me on his shoulders and he brought me into the sheep pen so now I can live uh, living water, green grass. He restores my soul. He brought me in. So I want you to hear this. Today, everything is what we take up. We, we, we take up self-improvement. All religions, you, you take it up. Much of Christianity today is you take it up. You try for a while. You test drive Jesus. What is that? Therapy is you, you take up this better life. Christ is offering you something completely different and better this morning. You can't make yourself a Christian. He takes you up and he makes you his own. I heard a preacher say, every Christian has something from another world come through the nursery door and it takes you up. Well, how do I know if it took me up? I hope everybody's asking that question. Simply, I take up what he took me up for. I press on. I am now a laser beam for him. I was religious and spiritual, but now it's an either or for me. It, it took me up. And our text says perfectly, no. Truly, it must be true of you. It's a lot easier to say creeds, wrote prayers, have doctrinal statements, confessions, church membership, than to have this. I call it the obedience of faith. I stole it from Paul. It's a pressing takes over, a laser that now narrows in to Jesus Christ, and you cry out like that songwriter, just give me Jesus. And my second point then is it, it takes you up. And I want you to wrestle this morning as you're sitting here, has it taken you up? And now we take hold of what has taken us up for our second point. Paul says, brethren, <clears throat> Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. In verse 13. In the Greek, it, it just says one thing. There's just one thing now. And, and my narrow focus now is it, it's Jesus. Everything has gone astray now. It's not a lamp. There's just this narrow focus to my life. Christ. All of life is no longer the lamp. Everything in your life narrows. This is your north star. It's what directs you and guides you and carries you and lifts you. Your entire life now is reoriented. And what, what, what do I mean by that? Well, your entire life, you see different by what has grasped you, by what has taken you over. You see life different. And I, I want Paul to give you his testimony if you'll look in Philippians 3, 4. Putting this tie on was really a dumb idea. I got to be who I am, man. <clears throat> okay, now get ready. Okay. <clears throat> verse, I'll start in verse 3. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. That's how you know you've been saved. I glory in Christ no confidence in my flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. You want to go to the hall of flesh? Paul says, I'm the guy. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. But here's what happened when the laser beam hit him. Whatever things were gained to me, all those things I was trying to do to get God's favor and labor under the law and do all these things to get accepted by God, um, that laser beam hit me. And when I saw Jesus, I knew I was in trouble. All my righteousness was a filthy act. So Whatever was gained to me, I thought it was working. Those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
So everything that I thought was earning me favor was leading me away from God. It was loss. It was actually not just zero. It, it was leading me from the Savior. And so if you're sitting here and all your good works and your religion and the things you're trying to do, you're here to say, I just want to get right with God. Give me a list. Tell me what to do. Let me get in a church. He's telling you that will lead you away from God. And so when, when that laser hits, all of a sudden you realize that everything I've been trying to do is a filthy rag. It's lost. The Greek word is manure. It's, it's, here's all my good stuff as a big pile of dung before God. That's what this laser does when it takes you up. You have a new accounting. You look at life completely different. And it's not just your good works. Now, look at verse 8. More than that, I count everything to be manure. What, and this whole world, everything that used to mean something and drove me and I gave my life to, how do I know if I've been taken up? It's manure. It's dung. And in light of how does it become dung? In view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count all those things rubbish that I might gain Christ. When I get taken up, everything that I once wanted now, I realize it's rubbish. I just need Christ. I need eternal life. I need God. That's all I need. I'm a laser. Give me Jesus. That's what happens when you're taken up. And that now I just want to be found in him, Jesus, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So, are we just always uptight then? I mean, just one thing. It, just, it feels like a fanatic. And I heard a preacher say this. He said, this one thing now gives you peace and joy and love. It doesn't stress you out. Like when I went after one thing when I was an unbeliever, it stressed me out. And if I lost it, I thought my life would come to an end. I just want you to see this. This one thing in Christ actually brings peace and joy. Fanatics? No, fanatics are not balanced. They're, they're out of balance in one thing. A, a, a laser focus now gets my whole life is Christ. So the fanatics aren't serious enough. The Christians are lasered on one thing. So what is that one thing? Look at verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm, I'm running to glory to be glorified with Christ. And so verse 10, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death uh, in order that I might attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect. So this is my one point. I want to know Christ. I, he's, he's it. He's everything to me now. Knowing him is becoming like him. And the way you know you know God is a consuming passion to know Him. You want this more than anything else. The Christian is about one thing. I think of Mary and Martha and Jesus saying to Martha, Oh, Martha, Martha, you're busy about so many things, but Mary has chosen the one thing necessary. That laser focus. That's it. Jesus is the laser beam that I may know him. So I pray, if we have 25 more years, may we be a laser beam church. I pray that Jesus would be what we look to and run to and desire and seek conformity to. Jesus. Someone said, knowing him is not the goal of life. It is, it is life. And so my question is, how do we do this? Go to verse 13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. It's the second time. He's just making sure you don't miss this. This is my focus. I'm, I'm not there, but I just keep narrowing in and moving forward in that direction. But one thing I do, one thing, I forget what lies behind 
and I reach forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. One of the main things that keep us from this laser focus is, is the past. And I'm forgetting what lies behind. And I've talked about that Greek word before. It, it means to no longer be affected by. There, there is a way that no matter what our past has been, there's a way forward that can begin to heal. And so our past could be maybe there's some hurts that are deep and I just can't forgive or let go. They just, they got me. It could be for Paul in this list was all of his self-righteous things that he was doing. You know, I've had people where all, all you talk about was 25 years ago when I was this, when I was that, when I served the church this way, when I was an elder. Um, you're, you're living in your past accomplishments. So you could live in your past failures you can live in your past accomplishments. There's a lot of things here today that are keeping you from reaching forward to what lies ahead. And that's what this gospel offers, is to set you free. And the way we do it is we're going to be reaching forward to what lies ahead of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We're going to laser. And we're going to keep looking at him and running to him. And he's going to begin healing these things that lie, lie behind and in our past. And so we want to reach forward to what lies ahead. And so what I want to offer to you is if God has been laying hold of you. And so what I, what I love is I feel no pressure to ever manipulate anyone into the kingdom of God because I can't. God has to come and lay hold of you. And if he has been working in your life and he's been coming and invading where you can't get them out of your head. You're losing peace. You're, you're losing your sleep. And it's beginning to just, all I can think about. But I used to make fun of Christians. And now I'm starting to think like one. I don't like this. And I'm telling you, God's taking you up. And it looks different where Paul got zapped. For others, I've known 10 years of, of this, him taking you up. It looks different in every life. But if you're here this morning, and God is working in your life. It's supernatural. He's coming. <laughs> I'm coming. He's after you. And so what, what he's beginning to show you is, I need salvation. I need God. I need my sins forgiven. So much guilt, so much shame of what I've done in my life. And nothing's getting rid of my guilt and my shame. And God's coming. He's, he's just bringing that up. And there's a Christ who hung on a cross and bore the wrath of God for every sin that you've ever committed in your life so that you could be forgiven this morning. And then he can give you a, a righteous garment, not your own, so that you can stand before God blameless and perfect. That's the best news you'll ever hear. You don't have to be perfect and blameless to stand before God. You have to have his. And I want you to hear that this morning if you're here to, to try to clean up your life and quit drinking. And, and how do I fix it? Jesus. And, and is he invading to take you up? And if he is, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you receive the salvation, your whole life changes to just say, there's one thing I do. Jesus Christ now is that. And that's what I'll pursue all of my days. And so that's why I picked that this morning, Southside. If we get any more days, I want it to be that. I want this laser focus on Jesus Christ and that we push each other to that laser and that's where we dwell. Take your eyes off that and there's no sense gathering. And so let's stare our eyes out at Jesus Christ. Riley, welcome back to the fold, brother. Let's pray. Father, what a gospel. Thank you that you invaded our lives. Thank you we were walking around happily in our sin and you made us unhappy in it. You started entering in and we couldn't find peace and joy in this world. The guilt of our sin began weighing on us and you lasered us with the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came in this world and died in my place, the Son of God offering salvation 
I pray, God, let anyone who needs him come this morning to Christ. Run to him now by faith. Call upon him that you might be saved. God, I pray for the believers, Lord, if we have drifted and we're, we're starting to remember what lies behind and we're caught up in a million different things like Martha and we're just running around, Lord, God, laser us this morning back. Re remind us of what you laid hold of us for. It wasn't to figure out this life and be successful. It was to run to Jesus Christ, to love him, to treasure him, to preach him and tell others about him. God, wake us up, bring us back, reorient us to that beautiful Savior so we can say, there's one thing I do. I press on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let, let us renew our commitment together here before the throne of grace to press on and run to Jesus Christ, to know him, and to be conformed to his image. God, I pray that you would do that in our midst. Thank you for this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.